Can you do it? No, nobody can. Nobody, nobody's ever done it. Nobody can do it. I think this is the creation of life and I think it's an experiment that shows that life is not a mystery. Next slide. You try to build a cell, even hypothetically, get the dream team, get the smartest people together. Can they build a living cell? I'll give you all, all the chemicals you want in homochiral form. And I'll give you even the informational code. I'll give you the whole code. In other words, you tell me how you want the DNA set up. I'll give it all to you. Now just assemble a cell. Go ahead. You got all your diacetyl lipids all in chiral form. Make your proto cell. Make it, put in your peptides any way you want, set it up, get your carbohydrates out there. I'll even hook the carbohydrates together. You just tell me the pattern you want. Then you got to stick them on your cell. Can you do it? No, nobody can. Nobody, nobody's ever done it. Nobody can do it. That's not to say it won't ever be done. I'm just telling you as of today, it hasn't been done and it's far, far away from being able to do it. Announcement marks a major turning point. Researchers have now created life from non-living parts. They call it a synthetic cell. World-renowned geneticist Craig Venter has been trying to unlock the mystery of life for 15 years. What have you achieved? Well, we announced today uh, the first synthetic cell. Instead of having a genetic relative that it evolved from, uh, uh, the parent of this cell is a computer. What Venter has done is astonishing. With just four bottles of chemicals off the shelf in his lab, his team replicated more than a million bits of genetic code to create a living organism. Here's how it worked. They isolated bacterial cells and removed all of their genetic material, the DNA from inside. Then they took those four bottles of chemicals and used them to create new genetic material. They transplanted it into the empty cell. That material, that new cell booted up and began to reproduce and reproduce a billion times. I think this is the creation of life and I think it's an experiment that shows that life is not a mystery, that it's not some mysterious force that infuses things that makes them come alive. If you put the right genetic message in the right order, put it into the right environment, it will come alive. Now that we're applying our intelligence to DNA yes. and are literally changing the code, we just had this huge breakthrough where an assembled piece of DNA was put into a cell and it replicated. What are the implications for that? I'm glad you asked that. There's a lot of confusion about this uh, recent uh, news story about Craig Venter's work. Uh, it's a brilliant technological achievement, but it is not producing, it, it was not the achievement that it was touted as, as achieving. It's, it's not uh, uh, artificial life. What he did was he took a, a piece of DNA, he copied it, and then put the same, DNA con contains information, he put the same information strand back into a cell and the cell was able to read it. It'd be like if you, uh, you wanted to have a, a, a copy of a file on my desktop, I made a file for you, we popped it in your computer and then you said, look, my computer can read it, I've created a computer. Uh, now all the important uh, information processing systems and all the other cellular processes were present in that pre-existing bacterium. All that was done was added a gene with some information and it was put into the, the system. It was an artificially copied gene, but it was put into a pre-existing life form. So, the, so the, he, he rearranged it. Well, it, essentially, he took a component and copied it and then put it back into an existing, an existing organism. Do you see a time where we could literally uh, design organisms? I don't. I, I, I think we, ha we really don't understand what life is. It's, it's, DNA is a, an unbelievably complex uh, molecule. It's full of code, and that is a fascinating thing. But DNA alone does not make an organism. We have to have all the, the information processing system that is provided by proteins. We have to have the cell membrane, and it's a functionally integrated system. Each one of these systems depends on the other in a tightly integrated way that uh, engineers would, would, mm -hmm. uh, would, would understand. So we, really, we don't, really don't have a, a sense of what would be required to design a whole, a whole organism. We know there's a lot of the necessary parts, but getting them all to fit together in the way that they do in an actual organism, it's a very difficult thing to conceive. People will quote to me this, synthetic cells. Well, in 2010, Craig Venter's group copied an existing bacterial genome and trans transplanted it into another cell. So what happens? I buy, I buy, say, a Corvette. And so what do I do? I take, I take the 
computer control box out of that Corvette. And I go to my clean room at the university and I copy the chips. I copy them. And I put my chips that I copied into that control box. And I go back and I stick that in my Corvette. And I say, I built that Corvette. <laughs> I made that Corvette. I, I did that. He just copied the same chip and you put it back in. That's all he did. He took another one in 2016 and he, he did something similar, but he, he took the control box and he knocked out all but 473 of the working devices and he stuck it back in the cell and like, whoa, you made a cell. No, he didn't. You just made a cell worse. You just chopped out a bunch of stuff and left just a few pieces to keep it operating enough didn't make the cell. There's all this complexity, all these interactives. Nobody ever made that. Nobody knows how to do it. Next slide. How close have researchers come to making an artificial cell? Well, we know now. We know how far they have close they've come. How do we know? Because in November 2018, this is just a couple months ago, Science Magazine, top journal, says biologists create the most artificial like, the most lifelike artificial cells. Whoa, I want to see what they've made. Let's how, see, see how far along it really is. Next slide. So they're commenting on this article which appeared in Nature Communications in November 2018. Communication and quorum sensing in non-living mimics of eukaryotic cells. Wow, they made these cells and they're, they're communicating with one another, quorum sensing, meaning that they can tell distance between each other. Let me read about this. Next slide. So semi-porous microcapsules were made of plastic, plastic from acrylate polymerization containing clay were prepared using modern microfluidic techniques done within a fabrication devices. So you go into a clean room, you build microfluidic devices, and you take, you, you polymerize, you make polymers around clay. That's all well known how to do that. That's what they did. These are plastic shells. Clays have a high affinity for binding DNA because clays are positively charged, DNA is negatively charged. So you add DNA to the solution, it goes through the porous plastic and binds to the clay. Then they add in, they buy ribosomes and, and, and uh, RNA enzymes and reagents were purchased or extracted, and they add that to the medium. Those diffuse into. And the normal protein synthesis starts taking place, which, which is normal synthesis, and then some of that diffuses out of those, and then the nearby ones they add some of it if diffuses into the nearby ones. The ones that are nearer get more diffused into them than the ones further away. Well, duh, that's normal diffusion gradient. The ones that are closer get hit more often. The chemistry is going to work. Next slide. The chemistry of the exogenously added reagents will work regardless of the container, whether it's a plastic semi-porous microcapsule, as was used, in a test tube, or in a large industrial production vat. The chemistry is the same. It's done all the time. You take these biological derived systems, you add them together, proteins will start being made. This is how proteins are made. You know, you buy these drugs. How are they made? They're made in vats. Well, this guy did it in a little microcapsule. That's the most lifelike system that's ever been made, according to Science Magazine. That's it. So, uh, uh, um, so it is far from the press hype claims of gene expression and communication rivaling that of living cells. That's what the press is saying. There is no rivalry here. No one. Further, one might arguably agree that these are indeed the most lifelike artificial cells yet. But that only serves to underscore the point. Nobody has ever come close to generating the workings of life. Nobody's even close. You do this chemistry in, in the lab all the time. So they did it in a microporous capsule. And they said, well, this is life. My test tube is life then. Next slide.